Isaiah 61, verse 2. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God or the day of recompense of our God and to comfort all who mourn. And then I want you to go with me into the 60th chapter of Isaiah. And I'm going to read six verses from there. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah and all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. You may be seated. There's two things I want to uh, say to you as I preamble here for a moment. And I want to thank Bishop Eastwood Onaba for the great three services that he held with us last weekend. I mean, they were life-changing and God touched so many hearts and so many lives. But the message that he preached, which was pretty much dominantly out of the 60th chapter of Isaiah, resonated, resonated so loud within my spirit and I felt like He'd laid a foundation, but I'm going to build off that foundation. But everybody say this word with me, come. He said this, he said, everything is coming. Everything is coming. And I'm going to address that a little bit more in depth here today. And I believe there are things that are in transit that you need to get ready to receive from God. Have you ever gotten notifications, say, from UPS or FedEx that you had a package that was in route and then they would give you a tracking number and then you could actually, everything has become so sophisticated, you could actually find out where the exact location of that package was at and uh, in essence, it's in, it was in transit. It was coming to you. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the United Postal Service, uh, but at least with FedEx, UPS, uh, RHS, and all the different ones that uh, ship products and supplies and uh, from Amazon, etc. Usually, you can track and know that something has moved from the warehouse and it is en route to you. I want to say this to you today. There is no slowdown in God's supply chain. No, I don't think you got that. I said there's no slowdown in God's supply chain. And things are in route to your life and you need to rise up and prepare yourself for their arrival. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. I was praying about this and then the Lord just began to speak loudly, loudly into my ears, the camels are coming. And this is something that I have preached before that Pastor Gala preached and ministered to the ladies about this. But I want to say this in regard to what God dealt with her about when she ministered on this subject. God gave her a vision. And I want to remind you of that and share that with you. He gave her a vision of a huge camel and then around the neck of the camel was this, you might say, identification tag. It was embroidered naturally if God gives Gala a vision. It's going to be very colorful and very brilliant and very bright and very ornate. But gave her a vision. And around the neck of the camel was like a big lanyard or name tag. And on the lanyard, she said, I saw my name. And her name was on this lanyard 
hanging around the camel's neck and on the camel, it, the camel was loaded with all types of different things. The gold, the incense, the precious jewels, the blessings of God. She said, but I saw more than that. She said, I saw like this caravan of camels and it wasn't just my name hung around the neck of the camel. It was the names of many of the ladies of our church. Now she was ministering in a directed pathway to women and she saw the names of many of our faithful women that were serving in the church and were being a blessing. And it was like the Lord was saying, the camels are coming with your name on it. And there are specified things that God is getting ready to do in your life specifically for you. And the camel or the transporter of the blessings of God are coming your way. Now I started in the book of Isaiah, the 61st chapter, where the prophecy concerning the ministry of Jesus is so articulately spoken by Isaiah, where he said to proclaim the year or the season of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance or the day of recompense. Everybody say recompense. Another synonym would be retribution. Another synonym of that would be payback. And when you study the entire chapter of the book of the 60th chapter of Isaiah, you've got to recognize something. God is prophesying to them about a payback. God is prophesying to them about retribution. He's prophesying to them about recompense. And I, I, I want you to grab this in the spirit because as Bishop taught out of the 60th chapter, he was talking about everything is coming. What's coming? There's a recompense coming. There is a retribution coming. There is a payback coming. And we live in this terminology, you know, uh, well, just let it go. I was in Louisville a few days ago with Pastor Ronnie Harrison and their great church there. And I, I really begin to say something to them. I said, I don't believe this attitude of just let it go is biblical. You know, God had a man named David that the enemy came in, the Amalekites came in, stole the wives, the gold, the silver, the flocks, burned their house down. And David didn't say, okay, now, Lord, just give me the grace to let it go. No, he went into prayer. And when he rose up out of prayer, he inquired of the Lord. He said, shall I pursue? But I need some direction and a promise. If I pursue, will I overtake? And he heard from heaven. God said, pursue and you will overtake. But then God said, and without fail, get it all back. Recover it all. I got a word from God for you. The thief cometh but to kill, to steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And I believe instead of rising up into this uh, spiritually passive mentality, we need to rise up like David did. We need to rise up like the sons and daughters of sh that should rise up and begin to say, I'm going to get it all back. If the enemy is stolen from you, you are on God's list for recompense, payback, and retribution. And the enemy has come to steal, he's come to kill, he's come to destroy, but that is not God's will for you. God's will is that you have life and that you have it more abundantly. God's will is that you prosper and be in health even as your soul does prosper and that's a good moment for you to give God a praise. So the 60th chapter of Isaiah really is a uh, prophecy concerning payback. And God's not saying you are coming to the light. He's saying the light is coming to you. Arise and shine for your light has come. See, a lot of you are, are saying, now with David, he went after it. He pursued, he overtook, he recovered all. But God's saying here in the 60th chapter, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. How many recall God spoke to Israel as they were at the Red Sea? Just stand still. The miracle is coming to you. So God said, arise and shine. This is Isaiah 60 verse 1. Arise, shine, for the light is come. I want to tell you something. 
the light, the glory is come. It's on you. It's around about you. It's behind you. It's in front of you. It's to the left hand. It's to the right hand. Then it goes on and says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon you. How many are ready for the glory of God to be noticed in your life? The Gentiles shall come to thy light. Now I'm going to be user friendly as you know I can be. The Gentiles shall come to thy light. So the Gentiles or the system of the world or the unbelievers shall be drawn to you or to the glory and to the presence of God that is upon you. I am so tired of listening to all the magnificent strategies of how to reach people. I grew up and had some heroes. One of my heroes was Oral Roberts, who in his latter years, we were so honored to have him multiple times in our pulpit. Oral drew people. They say, well, he used television and they used uh, uh, mailers and printed literature. I know they did all that. But the truth of the matter was when the glory of God was on all Roberts and he felt the fire of God in his right hand, blind eyes were opened and deaf ears were unstopped and cripples walked and the demon possessed were delivered. Over one million medically verified healings in the tent revivals and over five million verified salvations in the season that he erected the tent from one coast of this nation to another. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw people to me. And this is what I, God is saying in the 60th chapter of Isaiah. Thy light, thy light shall cause the world or the system or the unbelievers to come to thee. Now the Bible says in the 12th chapter of Romans said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we have become, the church has become this system conforming institution. We're trying to figure out how are we going to reach these people. You know, when you're dealing with a spiritual condition, you cannot rectify it emotionally. When you're dealing with spiritual disease, you cannot rectify it mentally. When you're dealing with spiritual bondage, you will not see liberation by trying to be like the world that has that person bound. Amen, pastor, that's good preaching. So we realize from the 60th chapter that the light has come. We realize that because of the light, the system or the Gentile will be drawn to us. We're all, it's like we're trying to cover up the glory. We get in the workplace and we just, oh, you know, I work for this company and this is their policy. And this is their stance uh, on uh, whatever it might be or whatever immoral, ungodly position that everybody seems to feel they have to take. And now Christians are trying to hide the glory. They're trying to hide their morality. They are trying to hide the strength of who they are. And I don't know about you, but I am so tired of being portrayed to be hateful when the greatest lovers in the world are the sons and the daughters of God. Now, if I'm a hater because I will not embrace immorality, I guess you're going to have to categorize me there. But because I'm a lover, I want to see people that are bound by substance abuse and bound by sexual immorality and bound by pornography and bound by a spirit of deception. I want to see people set free and the glory of the Lord is what will remove the burden and will destroy the yoke and God said that glory will cause the system to come to you. It also says in the third verse that kings will be drawn to the brightness of your rising. 
Let's go to the fourth verse. It said, lift up your eyes all around sea. They all gather together. They come to you. Now, that's really a great word to Israel. No, it's a great word to the church. Your son shall come from afar, and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. I'm telling you, Bishop dialed into this thing about family on Monday night, and I'm telling you something, there is going to be a restoration of families within the church instead of one of your children being saved and three of them being backslidden. How many believe God's going to bring your sons and your daughters and restore them into the things of God instead of your families being divided on where they worship? I'm telling oh, God, I'm going to get into trouble. But mothers and fathers, you have set the foundation. You have laid the foundation. You have revealed to your sons and daughters who they are in Christ. Well, now, because we're in this disrespect and dishonoring society, even in church attendance, sons and daughters say, oh, I'm not going to mom and dad's church. I got to find my own place. No, what you've got to understand, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God God of Jacob, the God of Joseph. Let me tell you something. The most blessed families in our church right now are the multi-generational families that they are serving God. Their sons and daughters are serving God. Their grandchildren are serving God. I've dedicated babies that are now bringing their babies. And you want to know something? I am watching the windows of heaven open up on second and third and fourth generation sons and daughters, but the enemy say it all. Keep us all divided. Keep us all severed. No. God said they're coming from afar. Fifth verse, please. Then you shall see and become radiant. You know, instead of, instead of being less, we're going to become more. And your hearts will swell with joy. Instead of just giving God a golf clap, you're going to start shouting like we just won the Super Bowl. Instead of just kind of patty-caking around it and doing the T-Rex praise. Thank you, Jesus. I'm telling you, God's so sick of this wimpy praise that people enter into. He's so sick and tired of people that just kind of want to, we love you, Jesus. Oh, come on. Where are the real men? Where are the real women of God? Where are the real sons and daughters of God? Where are the real warriors? Where are the men and the women holding a shield in their left hand and a sword in their right hand? Where are the men of God that will stand up and say, I am the redeemed son of God and I'm not ashamed to say so? Where are the ladies of God that are not passively sitting back but rising up and say, it's not just girl power, it's Holy Ghost girl power. Power. that you shall see and become radiant. You ever had somebody say to somebody, you're just glowing. Well, that's how it ought to be. We need to glow in the dark. Our hearts need to swell with joy. We need to be so full of the blessings of God that it's like our heart is exploding with the joy of the Lord because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. How did they bring things? How did things come? Well, they bring them in semi-trucks now, but the sea is still bringing the abundance of merchandise. The sea is still bringing products. The sea is still delivering to us food and grain. The abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. But I want to let you know something else. There's also oil wells being dug in the sea. Everybody wants to eat fish because it's healthy. My wife says, you haven't had enough salmon this week. I'm a man. I want steak. I want lasagna with Italian sausage in it. I don't want seafood lasagna. I want real lasagna. The kind of lasagna that caused Rome to rule the world. 
They probably didn't have that back then. <laughs> but it said, the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. So whether it's the fish of the sea, whether it's the oil that is being extracted out of the sea, whether it's the merchandise that is traversing from one nation to another through the, the great ships uh, that, are, that are carrying cargo. And I said to you er, earlier, God's supply chain has not been slowed down. And the wealth, I, I, I like it in the original case, it said the force of the Gentile shall come to you in a more contemporary translation says the wealth the wealth of the Gentile shall come to you so the wealth of the system the wealth of the system somehow some way the camels are coming next verse the multi everybody say multitude of camels shall cover the land. Now, how many remember when all this trucking stuff was happening up in Canada? The, the highways were jammed with semis and all the different political controversies surrounding it, which I'm not getting into that. But, but, but how many have ever been in a situation to where it's like the freeways were just jammed or you, uh, I remember a while back going to a Bronco game uh, when Peyton Manning was still playing Precious Memories, how they linger. Uh, and I, I remember trying to, I, I had a parking pass, and I was trying to get into the stadium parking lot where my parking pass was at, and it, it, it was uh, covered with camels, you might say. Every type of car, every type of bike, every type of motorcycle, and it was just jammed and it, the, it was just covered. But it said, the multitude of camels shall cover your land. How many are ready for God to start loosing blessing that is covering our nation, that is covering the land of the kingdom of God, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephod, uh, Ephah, and all those from Sheba shall come. Now let's talk about camels for a minute. Everybody say, the camels are coming. Uh, they, were, they were kind of the semi-trucks. They were the desert. They were the desert ships. On average, a caravan would travel about 20 miles a day. But here's, here's some interesting things about camels. Camels can survive three weeks without water. They can drink 26 gallons in 10 minutes. They can survive two weeks without food. They have as much as 80 pounds of fat stored in their hump. Dromedaries, and it's talking about dromedaries, can run up to 40 miles per hour in the desert which is faster than an Arabian horse could run in the desert. Let's just stop there for a second. When God is determined to bring blessing to you, it doesn't matter what is between him and you. Now, I'm going to talk about the Queen of Sheba in a minute, but when the Queen of Sheba was coming to visit Solomon. It was a 1,400-mile journey that was predominantly all desert. But the equipment that they were bringing, what they were bringing, to load it onto and to transport it, even though it moved slowly, were these camels. Now, we know the dromedary could run up to 40 miles an hour, but when you're dealing with a caravan, they move progressively, and on average, history tells us, huge caravans traveled about 20 miles per day. So now, what I'm saying to you is when God releases blessing to you, he doesn't care about what is in between him and you. And if what is in between him and you, you might say, is like a huge desert, 
God has a way of traversing the deserts of our life. He has the spiritual camel equipment that can go three weeks without a drink and two weeks without a meal. He has got something in his spiritual arsenal to load up and get to you what he has declared is yours. So when I'm praying and believing, I know as my wife show, saw in that vision that there's a camel with my name on it. How many have received prophecies of the blessings of God? That's a camel with your name on it. How many have had some dreams and visions of things that God wanted to do for your family or for your career or for your business? That is a camel with your name on it. And what God loads on your camel may be different from what he loads on your wife's camel. It may be different than what he loads on your friend's camel. But the truth of the matter, the desert doesn't intimidate God. Inflation doesn't intimidate God. Recession doesn't intimidate God. The Russians don't intimidate God. The Democrats don't intimidate God. The Republicans don't intimidate God. Poor leadership doesn't bother God. Atheists don't bother God. Agnostics don't bother God. Homosexuals don't bother God. Transgenders don't bother God. Oh, angry people people don't bother God. Violent people don't bother God. Murderers don't bother God. Betrayers don't bother God. There isn't anything in the desert of the system that is going to stop what God has intended to bless with you from getting to you. The camels are coming. You don't have to relocate. You don't have to move to a different part of town. You don't have to move to another country. You don't have to move to another city or another state. Solomon did not adjust his geography one bit. Let's go to 1 Kings 10th chapter, first verse. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, stop right there. We think that being conformed to culture is going to cause us to be more successful in the workplace. But it said the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord. And she came to test Solomon with hard questions. You see, some of you are afraid to get tested. The Bible said, prove me now here with saith Lord with your tithe and your offering and see if I'll not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing there's not room enough to contain. God's not afraid of you to test him. So why should you be afraid when a moment comes to put you to the test? We don't want our faith tested. We don't want somebody getting up in our face and say, well, what about this and what about that? But the amazing thing is wisdom doesn't come from your IQ. Wisdom comes from heaven. And if you're being put to the test by an atheist, an agnostic, someone that's immoral, someone that is trying to live a lifestyle and convince you that the lifestyle they're living is biblical and acceptable, I, I got a message for you. Solomon wasn't afraid to be tested. Next verse. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very large caravan with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. So now there are some historians that believe her caravan was made up of 800 camels. The camels are coming. 
And when you say a camel train, they had a camel train. And the sound of the constant pounding of the hooves of the camels upon the desert sand as they came toward Israel could be heard. And I want you to hear me today. Your blessings that are in route, you're going to start getting some notifications. Your tracking number is this. It's going to be on your front porch on such and such a date. This is going to break through. That is going to break through. But she came arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan with camels carrying spices, large quantities. Of, everybody say large. Quantities of gold and precious stones. She came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Next verse. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing. But he said, nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. Do you realize when you get the oil of God upon your head and your cup begins to overflow, nothing will be too hard for you to explain. I just, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why did this happen? Or why did that happen? It's almost like, uh, as they say, the elephant in the room. And like, let's not talk about the elephant in the room. Let's not deal with this. Let's not talk about that. But Solomon said, bring it on, girl. Fourth verse. And when the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, let's stop now. Let's stop. She saw and partook of his wisdom, but she also saw what he had built. Some of you are building some things in your lives and people are going to be ministered to by your wisdom and by your revelation, but they're also going to look at you by what you have built. And building is hard work. We have a give up society. We have a when the going gets tough, I'm going to try something else. You know, sometimes you just got to hang in there and do what you've got to do. Sometimes, I remember a few years back walking the floors of this building and praying and crying out to God that the needs of the ministry would be met because I knew if certain amounts of resources did not come in, there would be no way to meet payroll. There would be no way to pay the mortgage. And you know what? There were times that it would have been great to say, you know, I think, you know I'm getting older and I don't need all this pressure and I'm just going to travel around the world and enjoy preaching the gospel to whomever will open the no no the captain doesn't go leave the ship when there's a battle or there's a storm and so I just kept walking and I kept praying and I kept believing and nobody if anybody would have told me in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that God would begin to open up the windows of heaven on our ministry and greater blessing would come than we had ever seen in our history I would have told them they were crazy but I've got news for you when you hear from God and this mind is in you which is in Christ People are going to be blessed by what you think, blessed by what you say, blessed by what you declare, and they will be blessed by what you build. Quit abandoning the job site. Quit abandoning what God has given you to build. This isn't all about being comfortable. This isn't all about easy. This isn't all about, oh, I have a passion for this. There's a lot that I do that I'm not passionate about. Oh, if I'm going to pursue ministry or I'm going to pursue a career, I, 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 I want to be passionate. Of course, I'm passionate about a lot of what I do. But believe me, come Monday, there's a lot I have to deal with that I'm not passionate about. You think I get excited over hearing there's been an altercation in our parking lot at 3.30 in the morning and that's the first thing I hear when I get up in the morning? No, I'm not passionate about that. But I am passionate about this. God called me to cry aloud and spare not and lift up my voice like a trumpet and show the people of God the sin and reveal salvation. I sound like a trumpet and hit like a hammer, but there's a lot I have to do that I don't get all that excited about, but it still has to be done. Quit being quitters. Build something, young people. No, hear me again. Build something, young men. Build something, young ladies. Build something, young married couples. Keep building men and women of God. God, when you're weak, God is strong. 
Now, you don't know how I've been hurt. Well, get in line. Take a number. How many's been hurt? How many's been really hurt? Raise your other hand. All right, get behind all those folk. Well, you just don't have a caring heart. What you have is a heart that you'd rather have sympathy than when you would deliverance. Oh, I'm getting some golf claps on that, but I'm not getting any Super Bowl shouts. Oh, where are we now? Wisdom, what he built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings which he made at the temple of the Lord. She was overwhelmed. Okay, what's he overwhelmed with? His wisdom, what he built, the food on his table. Come on. The seating of his official, his order. His order, everybody say order. You know what righteousness is in a modern term? It's divine order. So she was looking. Every place she looked, the officials were seated in a certain way the attending servants in their robes. She was noticing how they were dressed. I get all sorts of old school comments because I still preach looking good. Now, this is what this generation wants me to do. Everybody, I got a word. Oh, we go have so much fun. Yeah, people are dying, shooting themselves. People are losing their lives. People are bound with depression. People are dying of cancer. People's kids are in trouble. People's kids are locked up in jail. And you want me to be cute? Give me a break. I'm an ambassador of Christ. When I walk on this platform, I don't represent the system. I represent the kingdom of heaven. And it caused the queen of Sheba to be overwhelmed because there was such order. <laughs> Sit down. Took my shoes off the other day, and people watch all that. Why did Pastor take his shoes off? I'm not even going to tell you why I did. So now they're going to tune in and say, What the heck happened to him? <laughs> she said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. Next verse. But I did not believe these things. See, we've got a generation that they don't believe that God still heals. They don't believe that God in the snap of a finger can deliver them of their depression and can loose them from their addictions. Until I came and saw with my own eyes and did not even half was told me. God's getting ready to lose something on the planet that people are going to begin to say the half has not yet been told. I believe it even says in the words that the world could not contain in book form all that Jesus did in the three and a half years of ministry. I got news for you. We're coming into a move of the spirit that the half has not yet been told. We have been so complacent to think that we've been there, seen that, and done it. Our eyes haven't seen it yet. Our ears haven't heard it yet. Neither has entered into our hearts, but I got a word for you. The camels are coming. The light has come. The Gentiles are coming. The sons are coming. The daughters are coming. They're coming. They're gathering. And our hearts are going to swell with joy. We're going to overflow with the radiance of the glory of God. It's not going to be like it was. It's going to be greater than anything the earth has ever seen. Eighth verse. Next verse. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. 
Praise be to the Lord your God who is to, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel because the Lord's eternal love for Israel. He has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. He has put, now this is not a Jesus people person talking. This is a woman that her deity was the son, but she's seen the glory of God. God, she's seen the real son now. And he has made you to do what? King, he's made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And I want to say something. When you see justice and righteousness thrown in the garbage bin like we're seeing it now, you can know one thing. Whoever is in charge is not hearing from God. But I've got some good news for you. There is some righteousness and judgment that's coming to this nation again. Tenth verse. She gave the king 120 talents of gold. 120 talents of gold is 9,000 pounds of gold. Now let's just bring it into 2022. And she gave the, put that back up there. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices, precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those Queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. Now, 120 talents of gold is 9,000 pounds of gold, which equates in modern values she just sowed an offering of $200 million. Now, I don't know how long it took her to get from point A to point B. Some say six months, some say up to three years. But what I want you to stop and think about, Solomon's being Solomon. He's doing what God has given him to do day to day to day. Queen of Sheba leaves her homeland with the equivalent of $200 million worth of gold on the backs of the camels that are coming. Solomon doesn't change his direction. He doesn't say, okay, now we need to redo everything. I heard through the grapevine that the Queen of Sheba was coming and we want to make her comfortable. We want everything. But Solomon just kept being Solomon. I want you to know something. When the enemy came in and destroyed the nation of Israel, one of the key things that he st they stole was their identity. And I believe the church has lost its identity. I was reading an article about a church that sponsored a transgender event and created a room, a room in the house of God to help transgender young people find clothing. You, you hearing me? In a church. We have lost our identity, but recompense is coming. There's a payback coming. Every demonic lie that has infiltrated the pulpits of America, God is going to begin to deal with it, and he is going to bring to naught the things that Satan has raised up. Satan is trying to exalt himself in the house of God. He is trying, instead of putting a Tim Bagwell behind the pulpit, he's putting men and women behind the pulpit that tells you that certain sins and certain immoralities and certain lifestyles, that's okay. Believe me, we just want to hug everybody. I love everybody, but I don't love what everybody does. Uh, we, if, if you listen to the news, you pray for the people that have committed violent crimes, that have done certain things, but do you love what they did? No, you should hate what they did, but not hate them. I'm getting golf claps now. She came with $200 million worth of gold and large quantities of spices. And this is where we miss it in this. Let me tell you something about the spices. Most historians believe that the value of the spices superseded the value of the gold. Now, I'm going to show you some things typologically here in just a moment. Everybody okay? Am I boring you? Everybody say, the camels, the camels are, coming. are coming. 
I wrote down some things. How many recall the story of the alabaster box and the oil and the ointment? What was in the alabaster box? Some oil. We look at oil and things like that now. It's just something, you know, you go and you buy a little bit of it and that's really nice. That alabaster box contained something that was the equivalent of a year's income. It was a spice. It was an embalming spice. But it was worth a year's income. Now let's go to something else. Now this is all Jesus' time, a few hundred years later. Everybody say cinnamon. My wife loves cinnamon in her coffee. I do not know why. Now I like cinnamon on a sweet potato. You know, like a pound of butter and a little cinnamon. You know, on a good healthy day, that's what you want. A little cinnamon on sweet potato. Coffee, I don't get it. On our counter by our coffee maker is a little thing, you know, like a pepper shaker of cinnamon. I don't think much about it. She wants to put that in her coffee, so be it. But in the days of Jesus... A pound of cinnamon, a pound of cinnamon was worth six years' wages for a centurion. Put it into numbers. A pound of cinnamon was worth in what today's numbers would be about $45,000. Lord, if I paid $45,000 for a pound of cinnamon, it wouldn't be sitting on my kitchen counter. It would be locked up in my safe. You with me? A pound of pepper was considered, pepper was considered the least valuable spice. A pound of pepper could be traded for 40 pounds of wheat. A pound of pepper, you could trade it for 40 pounds of wheat. You say, what are you trying to say? There had never been brought so many spices to Israel like the Queen of Sheba brought and from that day forward no one ever brought as much spice to the nation as the Queen of Sheba did. You know what I'm saying? The camels are coming. So if there was $200 million worth of gold there was probably another 200 to $300 million worth of spices. Now we're up to half a billion. And she leaves her homeland, and whether Solomon knew she was coming or not, she was in route. And her 800, and I'm not saying that was the exact amount, but uh, let's just say a huge quantity of camels that was carrying anywhere from 300 to 1,000 pounds of goods or whatever it might have been were loaded down, and they were moving slow, about 20 miles a day on a 1,400-mile uh, journey. Most estimate it took at least six months. But I, I don't know. Solomon just seemed to keep being Solomon. He just kept believing God. He kept doing the things that God told him to do. But something was coming to Solomon that he had no idea what was coming to Solomon. And she didn't ride into Jerusalem and said, here, here's a half billion dollars worth of spices and gold. No, she came in and she put him to the test but it didn't rattle him because the hand of God was upon Solomon the anointing of God was upon him I want you to know something she was bringing him gold and the gold was it was symbolic of something it was symbolic of prosperity it was symbolic of wealth it was symbolic of earthly riches but she also brought him the incense she brought him the spices which was symbolic of worship and symbolic of heavenly riches. 
The camels are coming, church. Uh, they're going to come and bring us natural things, but they're also coming with a new wave of the blessings of God. There's a new kind of worship that's coming on the scene. There's a new type of commitment that's coming on the scene. I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. There is something new and something fresh, and it's not going to be, oh, I've got to worship God because the music has slowed down. No, there is a prostrating uh, and a serving and a recommitting to God uh, like we have never seen before. This embracing of what God is not for is going to stop in the true churches of the Lord God. God's raising up another generation. He is raising up warriors. He's raising up Joshua's. He's raising up David's. He's raising up Solomon's. Uh, and everything we need to do what we're called to do has got a camel loaded down with our name on it. Somebody praise God. Put that scripture back up there. She gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices, precious jewels. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. And we're going to stop here today. I want you to hear me on this. This is the part that I, I, I want to get through to you. There is blessing that has been released from the heavenly warehouse. There's blessing that's been released with your name on it from the heavenly warehouse. The Bible, that was King Solomon. Well, the Bible says we are kings and we are priests unto God and unto his father. And there is a generation that are not going to be conformed to this world, but they're going to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. I'm going to go and I want to read something to you. I'm going back to 1 Kings, um, the 10th chapter, but I want to read it straight out of the King James Version. If I can get out of 2 Samuel. No. And when the queen of Sheba, this is the fourth verse, you can put it back up on the screen, but I'm going to read something here. This is out of the King James. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built, the meat of his table, the sitting of his servants, the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and his ascent, which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her, no more breath in her, uh, other translations said she was overwhelmed. And you say, why are you reading it out of the King James? I want, you, I want you to catch something here. There is a major emphasis about their apparel. And I, you know, and I got you laughing when I took my coat off and pulled my shirt tail out. But I want to say something very seriously to you. She would have been able to identify any person that was under Solomon's hand by their apparel. They had apparel that was in agreement with their position. And I know this is very counterculture, but I do want you to stop and think for a moment that she judged Solomon, first of all, by the manifestation of the gift that was in his life. That was his wisdom. Then she judged Solomon by what he had built. He had built his palace. He had built the temple. Then she judged him by the order that he established his kingdom with. And why was the term apparel brought up? You know, why, why did that move her? Because the apparel connected the people to their King given position. And I don't know, I don't know sometimes, I think one of the things, and I look so silly with my shirt tail out, but I guess I'm cool now. I've got the French cuff and the shirt tail thing out. So. There's something about this thing on apparel 
that is definitely a connection to position. But one of the things that the heathen stole from Israel was their identity. Joseph received a coat of many colors, and that was part, not just, Daddy loved me and gave me a pretty coat. No, the coat spoke of his destiny, that he, even though he was not the oldest, was going to be the son of the double portion. That coat of many colors said to every brother, when dad dies, Joseph's taken over. They got angry at the garment as well as Joseph. So they ripped the garment, poured blood on it, and threw it at their father's feet, totally dishonoring him. It's real quiet. I want you to get this. When Jacob saw the coat, he saw the son's garment, and Joseph was called the son of his old age, which meant he was the son of his future. Your future goes beyond your natural lifespan. So what could they do? It was not just, well, let's just let daddy know that he was killed. They could have just come in and said, listen, we saw this wild beast rip him apart. Joseph's dead. No, they brought the garment and dishonored him. Give me my coat. They took the garment that Jacob had given him. They spilled animal's blood on him and they lied and they walked into Jacob and threw it at his feet. Your favorite's dead. They threw the garment at him. You can keep it right there. They threw the garment at his feet. Well, we know the story. Then he goes to Potiphar's house. And you've heard me talk about this before. He goes to Potiphar's house. And the Bible said Joseph was a prosperous and in Joseph was prosperity. And everything in Potiphar's house began to elevate. Potiphar became richer. He became more blessed. He became more prosperous. Well, then when he wouldn't sin, the lady, I guess that's the woman, ripped his garment off of him. The garment said to everybody, Joseph is the major domo of this house. There's not a business decision that gets made that he doesn't make. And you know how they knew it was Joseph? His garment. What did she take? She ripped his garment off of him and threw it at Potiphar's feet. Say, now what are you going to do about him? And that garment yelled at Potiphar and said, I trusted you. I empowered you. I positioned you. And they found Joseph and they put him in jail. And that garment was probably burnt, ripped to shreds. And he wore a prison garment. She was moved by their apparel. One of the things that Israel had lost in the 60th chapter, you understand it's a chapter of recompense and restoration. What they had lost was their identity. Then we know Joseph gets called before Pharaoh. He interprets a dream. And after he interprets a dream, he gives him a word of wisdom. You need somebody to manage the affairs so you flourish in the famine. And he looked at Joseph and he said, I found him. And he put on another garment that nobody ever touched again. When he stepped into destiny, ladies and gentlemen, because he refused to be a compromiser, he was ultimately covered with destiny that no one could ever touch again. Israel lost their identity. The church of 2022 has lost its identity. But I've got some good news for you. The camels are coming. 
and they're coming to the sons and the daughters that refuse to conform to the world but are transformed by the renewing of their minds. Listen, I want you to hear me on this. God is going to renew our youth like the eagle. God is going to crown our heads with loving kindness and tender mercy. God's going to satisfy our mouths with good things. God is going to do miraculous things. This is not just about word of life. This is not just about me. This is about every one of you. God wants you to rise up and put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You say, Pastor, you don't understand all that's going on in my life. I do understand this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God will deliver you out of them all. I am preaching this. This is not just about 9,000 pounds of gold or a quarter billion dollars worth of spices. This is about the fact that for weeks or months or maybe years, there was a blessing in route to Solomon that I presume he had no idea, but she didn't release that blessing until he proved that gift, until he revealed the integrity of his kingdom, until she saw him go to God and offer sacrifice and said her heart, the spirit was lost and she was overwhelmed. She couldn't even describe it anymore. The half has not yet been told and now she says here, 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 here's uh, here's uh, $200 million of gold. Here's $300 million in spices. Here's an innumerable amount of gems. I, I tell you, blessing is coming to you from sources that you never knew it would come. Favor is coming to your careers. Favor is coming to your businesses. Favor is coming to your families from sources you never thought it would come. Uh, the camels are coming. Somebody give God a praise. Hallelujah. Help me. Try to get my garment on here. So are you trying to tell me how to dress? No, I'm just trying to tell you don't lose your identity. Uh, are you trying to tell me I have to wear a suit? No, I'm telling you don't lose your identity. You, you trying to say I need to wear high heels instead of no, I'm trying to say something to you. Don't lose your identity. Don't lose your identity. Don't lose your identity. When his brothers desecrated the coat of many colors, it was his identity. When they stripped him of the major domo robe, it was his identity. I tell you, every devil in hell is coming after your prophetic identity. He's trying to hurt you. He's trying to break you. He's trying to disrupt your emotions, your thinking, how you prepare for your future. He's trying to say the business that God gave you is not going to make it the career God gave you it's not good no 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 she judged him by the gift that manifested in what he built quit don't stop building don't stop building don't stop working don't stop trying don't stop fighting don't let the devil close the doors on your blessing don't let him steal your identity saith the Lord somebody give God a shout today I'm trying to be quiet, but I'm going to say something to you. Sit down for just a second. I'm... When I first came back to Denver, when Gail and I first came back here, we had a facility that when my dad passed the baton to us, the torch to us, we were located at 4625 East Iowa Avenue, and that's not too far from I-25 and Colorado Boulevard. The building seriously needed work and renovation to kind of get it to function in agreement with the, with the vision. And there was a man that I had met years before, and he was a, um, he was a professional. I, I believe he was a CPA. He was a very well thought of, had his own accounting firm, et cetera, et cetera, and had some real serious setbacks. And he was working as one of the laborers on this project and I begin to dialogue with him because he'd actually attended my meetings he'd actually attended my meetings uh, a few years before and I remembered him and I said are, are you and I called his name he said yes and I just began to talk to him and minister to him and I knew he'd been through a real tough season 
A few months later, he came to me with tears in his eyes and he said, he said, I was doing this labor that was totally nothing connected to what I was educated for, what I'd done before, and I was just doing what I had to do to pay the bills. He said, but when you talk to me, you talk to me as if I was still a CPA. I said, well, that's who you really are. He said, well, I know that. But I had paint all over me. I had a paintbrush in my hand. My hair was a mess. My clothes looked horrible. But you spoke to me as though I was a success. Oh, well, now by this time, he'd bounced back. He'd restarted his accounting firm. He's talking to me in a suit and a tie. He said, I just want to thank you because you saw the real me when everything in my appearance was not who I really was. See, the devil's out to steal your identity. He's out, you might say, this man was a professional businessman, three-piece suit and a tie, but now, and, and there's nothing wrong with being a blue-collar construction person, and, and please don't interpret any disrespect to that. Obviously, you're not going to go out in a three-piece suit and a tie and put a roof on a house or pour a concrete foundation or whatever it might be. That's not how you would work. But what had happened to him, his identity had been stolen. And this is what the enemy is trying to do to all of you. Your camels are coming. Now you may say, well, they're going to get here in six months, three months, three years. I, I can't put a timetable on your camel. But I can tell you this. Everything you need to have added to you to be who God says you are is coming. Is coming. Everybody okay? I'm trying to shut up. I stood in this building. My board will never know, and you will never know the pressures that my wife and I carried. probably around 2017, 18, 19. Every week was like, God, will we have enough? And the church comes and they says, we love your facility, we'd like to buy it. And at that moment, what I feel like, God, I'm gonna die young by my perspective. God, I, I, I can't keep living under this. I had peers in the ministry said, Pastor, you can't keep living under this pressure. They offered us 17, 18 million dollars for this facility. But paid off all the bills and had millions in the bank. You want to know how easy it would have been to say, where do I sign? We'll figure it out later. But I came back to this room and I walked these floors. I said, God, what do you want me to do? He said, why did I have you build this building? I said that it would be a house of proclamation in a house of demonstration. He said, then you're just gonna have to trust me. He didn't say the camels are coming, but what he was saying to me was somehow, some way, I'm gonna make a way. And I got through 2018, got through 2019, things, you know, weren't great, but they weren't bad. You know, it was just kind of like, oh God, you know, at least I can breathe a little bit. In 2020, the world changes. I didn't realize the camels were coming. 
I didn't realize it before 2020 was over. And 2021 was over. That God would open up the windows of heaven on our ministry like we had never seen it before from sources we never dreamed it would come and in ways we never thought it would come. And I could stand before you today and say, yes, I walk the floors and I pray that every need will be supplied. And I still walk the floors and pray for the glory and still walk the floors and pray that everything God has prophesied over this church and what it would be. We walk through things that you do not know about. About, and we walk through battles that you did not know about. But I want to tell you something. On all points, God has been faithful and God has heard our prayers and God has answered our prayers and God has made a way where there seemed to be no way. And I can stand before you today and I can look at you not through, not through a lens of trying to convince myself, but I can say to you, I am who God says I am. Everything God has ever said to me about my identity, about Pastor Gala's identity, about this church's identity. It is real. And you say, well, Pastor, so many people just watch online. They don't come back through the doors. They're coming, baby, because the camels are coming. And when the camels get here, they're going to get here. Your camel is coming. It's got your name on it. My camel had my name on it. Our ministry had my our name on it. And I've got good news for you. The God of Solomon is your God. The God of David is our God. The God of Israel is our God. And I don't want you to be discouraged uh, because no matter what you need to fulfill what you're called to do, it's coming. Everybody say, it's coming. Uh, say it again, it's coming. Somebody give God a shout. I hope you got something out of this. It doesn't matter. Folks, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how hot the desert is, God will get it through the heat. It doesn't matter how treacherous the journey is, God will get it through the debauchery of the enemy. It doesn't matter how many devils are pitted against you, God knows everything he said and everything he's declared. And I want you to hear me for the 10,000th time. You are who God says you are. The devil can't steal your identity. He he will not steal your destiny. He will not steal what he, God has blessed you with. Give God the kind of shout he's worthy of.